Okay, so a few people asked me if I would be willing to do some videos, a little bit of watercolor. So today we are going to be painting the sky here. It's a cloudy sky at dawn. So we want a lot of variation in the clouds. What I'm gonna do is first I have this water bottle here. It's just a regular spray bottle from wherever Home Depot. And what we wanna do is get lots of nice fat drops here. So we're just gonna spray that through the sky. I'm avoiding the bottom because I don't really want clouds down there. And then what you do is you take a brush, nice thin brush. This is called a rigger brush. Um, it used to be used to paint rigging on ships. So that's why it's called that. And we're going to be taking a little bit of yellow, azo yellow here. I don't know if you can actually see this. And we will just put some in there. Where we want it to be nice and bright. And the idea is it should spread. So I'm gonna do the same thing. A little bit of yellow through here. I don't have quite enough water over there. It's okay if it gets a little messy at the edges. We can go over it with some other stuff after. But I have a rough idea here from my reference photo of how I want the clouds to go, but you have to embrace a little bit of unpredictability. It's not going to go exactly the way that you want it to go. But it can surprise you in great ways. Just a little bit of yellow. And right here. See how it kind of naturally makes cloud shapes just on its own? It's magic. I didn't even have to do anything for that. Get some more water over here too. And you can also spray into an area that you've already painted. We're gonna add some Paranone Orange here. Just a touch. Oh, that was a bit more than I wanted. But see how it shakes out. They say with watercolor, if it looks right when it's wet, then it's not dark enough. So it's okay sometimes if you paint it and it turns out a little bit darker than you thought it was going to be. And that's kind of run down here, which I don't mind, but I want it to look a little more natural than that. Yeah, I like what I've got going on here. filmed anything with this before so I'm hoping you'll be able to see it properly at the end. Well, it's starting to dry up in the upper clouds here so we're just gonna add some more yellow up this way. You want a little bit of water with your yellow but not too much. You're really letting the water on the paper do the work. Oops, I think it just tripped. It's a happy accident after Bob Ross. These nice cloud shapes continue all the way up to the top of the sky. It was a beautiful morning. So I'm just going to continue them. And then after this dries, I will go in and paint the rest of the sky. But I don't want to be mixing blue in here just yet because it will give me green, which I don't really want. I learned this cloud technique at a workshop last year with David Smith, he's a watercolor painter. I think out of Wisconsin, I'm sorry. I don't remember, but. He traveled around a lot before, well, you know, before everything. And I was lucky. 
lucky to take his workshop here. So that was a Venetian sky that when we painted it with him. Oh, I like how that's coming out up there. I hope you can see that. I don't know. This is one of those tricky, I mean, it's not tricky. It's very easy actually, but you do have to work a bit quickly while things are still wet. It's the funny thing about watercolor is uh, hurry up and wait. Lots of little cloud shapes here. And when you're painting clouds, what you usually want is because of them being further away from you, they're going to get smaller towards the horizon. So if you can make sure that you're painting them in a way that shows smaller little clouds, then you're automatically adding perspective and you didn't even have to work for it. Not too hard anyway. sky not too much but I really want that sort of glow at sunrise this is a reference photo from one of my many quarantine walks in the neighborhood and we get some very beautiful sunrise and sunsets here big prairie skies. Got a harder edge there than I want. I'm actually gonna spray into that a little bit. But, and that's something you can absolutely do. Um, you can add water back in. I actually have a bit more water at the edge there than I wanted, but it's okay too, we can work with that. I might just um, really grab a shop towel here. You can do two things here. You can take just a, a tissue or a towel and soak that, or another thing that you can do is take a brush that's been moistened clean brush, moistened that doesn't have, doesn't have any paint and it just has a little bit of water so it's thirsty to soak up more water and you can just, oh, there's more water there than that brush can handle so I'm going to use a shop towel and just dip the corner in so that you're soaking up some of the excess water there that you didn't want. I think that looks better already. And I like a little bit of this orange, I think, up towards the other part of the sky, too. So we're going to paint that here. Just to unify it so that we've got some of the same colors throughout. Otherwise, it might look a bit weird. Looking at that, yeah, that's I think that's good. So in watercolor, when you're painting uh, near the edge of an area that's wet, you get these nice um, soft. They call them lost edges. So where the paint just sort of melts in, and you don't have, like here, I've got a little bit of a hard edge. If you can see that. And it's okay because some of the edges of the clouds are a little bit hard, but in general, clouds, you know, that's soft and fluffy. Um, and you're not usually going to want to have too many hard edges mixed in there, so that's why I'm going to add a bit more water here. If you're painting uh, wet in wet 
So you're adding wet paint and water into an area that's already wet. You're gonna get some of those nice lost edges. I think that's coming out really nicely. I like it. What I'm going to try to do is once this dry, once this dries, we're going to be adding some of the blue that makes up the sky there, um, and we're going to spray it again to add a bit of water. But we're going to try not to reactivate too much the yellow that's here because I don't want it going all green on me. That's the trick. Yeah, I think that looks good. Okay, so here we are, part two of this painting. Um, unfortunately, I had a little bit of technical difficulty with the painting the second time there. I thought I was taking a video of myself painting all of the blue that you can see here in the sky, but it turns out I didn't start the video correctly. So I talked to myself for 20 minutes for no reason, and I did not explain what we did in the sky. So basically, um, the Coles Notes version is I did a little bit of spraying up in here to sort of soften these edges, but I also used this larger brush here that's uh, an Escoda Versatile is a synthetic brush that very closely mimics how a sable brush works. So I used this nice fat brush and I went up here with a little bit of Prussian blue at the top to make it darker. And then as I went down, I switched to French ultramarine and I just painted in some of these different cloud shapes here. And then as I got closer to the bottom, I switched to a smaller around uh, size six brush and I just painted Again, with a little bit of spraying, and I ended up changing to a cerulean blue because I wanted it to be lighter at the horizon here. So there are three different colors of blue incorporated in the sky. It's uh, mostly dry now, and I am ready to start painting the snow that's at the bottom, which is kind of exciting. It's a little bit fun to paint snow. Uh, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take a nice big, where is my... I lose something I have one desk here we go okay so this is a big big mop squirrel hair brush here um, and in my previous video I talked a little bit about I know some people don't like to use um, animal hair brushes uh, unfortunately I have found that there are not very many brushes that can mimic some of the specific ones so this is a mop that I use and what I'm gonna do is just Unlike the sky, I'm not going to be doing uh, the spraying for this one. I'm just going to wet all of this here. And I had mentioned, but you probably didn't hear, was that um, there's going to be lots of dark trees and things going over top of um, where the sky ends. So it's okay that this is just, I'm going to bring this right up to here. And if a little bit of color bleeds into it, that's fine. That'll give me the base for what I want. And the reason that I'm wetting this quite a lot first is because I'm going to be putting just the background for what I want my snow to look like. So I'm going to be taking a little bit of azo yellow that I used in the sky because the snow is highly reflective and I want that, I want that color mimicked in there. And then I'm gonna be taking my Escoda brush here, a nice big thick one, to make sure it's nice and clean because I don't want I don't want anything coming, any of the other colors yet. I don't want them, oh, damn it. See, I set it, and as I set it, I did that. It was not as clean as I wanted it to be. You can't even probably see my palette in the video unless I move it there. So I have to try to clean up this yellow a little bit. I think I got it. Excuse my profanity in the middle of my <laughs> teaching video. My son isn't in the room, so. Okay, this is, you know what, I'm just gonna take a different brush is what I'm gonna do, because this isn't working out for me. And meanwhile, everything else is drying. I really don't wanna paint the snow green. So if you're lucky enough to have 
alternate brushes, I have a smaller uh, little mop squirrel brush. So I'm just going to take a smidge of that. And we don't want it to be super yellow, but especially you want that glow, like here where the sun was actually rising from. There's quite a lot of quite a lot of light coming from that, and that's the feeling that we're trying to evoke here. So, um, and again, it will lighten as it dries, so don't freak out. <laughs> Somebody I used to raid with used to say that, and it drove Voss crazy. She'd say, okay, don't freak out. He's like, I'm not freaking out. But anyway, don't freak out. There's actually a spot that was a bit dry there. And I don't want that because I don't want a hard edge, so we're just going to bring that a little further. There we go. That's good. And some of that reflection will come all the way up this pathway here. <laughs> it was funny. Um, when I did the David Smith workshop that I was mentioning, there were lots of older ladies, you know, I don't know, I guess a watercolor just attracts, like, for fun. Um, ladies like to take it up as a hobby, but, um, and they were so sweet, but he'd be working on a demo and he'd go in really dark with a color and I swear you'd hear the gasps echoing around the room. <gasps> and then, you know, one lady would say, he's, he's going to ruin it. He's going to ruin it. And, um, I found it was really funny. I don't know if it's just coming from a different background, um, as a printmaker, as an artist, when I was in college, sort of one of the first things you have to learn is you can't be too precious about, you know, things happen. So yeah, sometimes you're gonna ruin it, you know, and you have to ask yourself, what is the worst thing that can happen? Um, you waste a piece of paper, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's not too much of a financial strain for you, but you know, if you own the paper in the first place, you're probably okay and you're learning. So, you know, and we're all, always learning. I mean, I, I wreck a painting, gosh. Um, I had to completely redo a commission just last week, or um, sorry, last month. Time has no meaning. Um, because it just wasn't working out, you know, and I had to abandon it, and I ended up needing a couple different colors of paint that I hadn't had on hand. I'm adding a little bit more yellow in here, because this whole hill here has lots of sort of dry grass and like winter grass on it and I'm going to be adding that in but it is not a bad thing to have that color in behind. You always have to be thinking about the layers of what you're painting and what you're going to be putting over top so you want to leave some white so that you get that nice contrast difference um, but you know you also want that sort of glow from behind and, and then I'm just adding little dots of yellow here because uh, the snow that I'm going to be painting, it's quite, quite marked up. Like it's a pathway. People have been walking alongside the pathway. So there's divots and it's not perfectly smooth. It's not fresh right after a snowfall, which I feel like kind of defines me for all of 2020. So I'm just adding those dots in. And um, yeah, so we're pretty much done with the yellow here. I am going to just pause this and use my blow dryer to dry everything. Okay, so uh, we're back. I mostly dried this paper. You might be able to see on the camera, there's a little shiny spot here. You can tell there's still water on the surface, but I didn't paint near that, so I'm not worried about that because the next thing I'm going to be doing is wetting the entire paper anyway. So that really, that really doesn't matter to me. Um, and it's actually a good time to mention um, when you're doing watercolor painting, the importance of your support is like can't be overstated. So this is I paint on Arsh 140 pound uh, watercolor paper, which is like basically kind of the the least weight. They refer to the paper weight in terms of the thickness. It's however many pounds of like material goes into making it. So it's thick enough and heavy enough that you can just tape the edges like this and paint on it, and it's not going to buckle too terribly much. Um, 300 pound paper doesn't buckle pretty much at all with the same sort of treatment, but it's way more expensive. So I find this paper is a good mix between, I mean, it's still a pricey paper, but 
it's it's worth it. It's very high quality, um, and I think that a lot of people who try watercolor painting end up getting frustrated because maybe they start with really cheap materials, and especially the paper, it makes a major difference towards how, how your paint behaves and the quality of the painting you're going to be able to do on it. Even if you're just learning, I think it's worth investing in some quality uh, supplies because it will help help you actually enjoy and maybe do more painting. So um, the next thing we're going to do, it's a little counterintuitive, I'm actually going to wet, I'm going to wet this whole paper again. So I dried it and now I'm going to wet it. But the reason that I dried it is because I did not want my yellow blending in with the blue that I'm going to be painting over top of it. Now, painting over this, I'm being very, very delicate because when you add water back on top of an existing watch wash, you can reactivate the paint a little bit. So we might get a little bit of blending, but not nearly as much as if I had tried to paint it while everything was still wet. So that's why you do the drying in between. and. Um, I just have a cheap little travel blow dryer that I keep here in my studio. It's pretty much perfect because um, if you know me, uh, you know I'm I'm the mom of a young I have a young son. I don't get a lot of time to paint, so when I do paint, I want to be able to maximize that time that I have and uh, make sure that I'm getting the most out of it. So I dry in between layers. You just have to be careful not to blow the paint around too much. So now I'm taking some cerulean blue because I think it's the perfect blue for what we're doing. Although yeah, maybe a touch, just a little bit of French ultramarine as well. And that's what, this is the blue, the cerulean, this is the ultramarine, if you're wondering. And then I'm just adding some divots here and you're gonna see they're bleeding a lot. That's fine, um, I, I want that. I don't want super hard edges for this. Um, it's all, it's all part of the plan. It's gonna give that winter snow feeling here. This area had a bit, was a bit heavy on the pigment. That's why I'm taking it off again. And um, yeah, so we're just gonna paint happy little snow. I liked the idea of doing a dawn. Maybe it's a little heavy handed, the metaphor, but I, it's December 31st when I'm recording this. I liked the idea of doing a dawn painting. And um, so that's why I chose this for today. I don't have any big plans for New Year's, obviously, because uh, currently where I live here in Alberta, Canada, it we're under a lockdown. Um, so we're not supposed to be socializing with people, uh, restaurants are closed except for takeout, etc. Uh, to be clear, I wasn't going to go anywhere anyway. Um, I have a young son, first of all, and secondly, we've been really COVID conscious, so it just wasn't going to be happening. And I'm going to not put too much blue up here at the beginning of this sort of the trailhead here, I guess, or where the trail goes into the horizon because it's, um, I want that glow from the sunshine. I don't want to cover it too much. There'd be no point in having done it in the first place. And as I paint, I'm just kind of, um, I'll take a little mix, like I'll take a little bit of cerulean, I'll add a little bit of French ultramarine into it in spots so that it's not all just one color, but that's fine. And then the shadows, of course, um, on the snow here, they get darker as we go further. So I hope to illustrate that. <laughs> this whole painting could turn out to be garbage and you guys will be like, why, why was she telling us how she painted this? This is terrible. But you know what, like I said before, you, um, there's no wasted time. You know, if you do a painting and the end result wasn't great, well, you still learn something about how you work or what you might do differently next time. Um, and this is sort of a weird, this is like the um, adolescent stage of a painting, you know, it's got enough on it that it's starting to come together a little bit, but it still looks a bit like you're not entirely sure maybe where I'm going with this. It, it's not finished, um, you know, and well, 
that's just the way things are. It takes a little bit to come together. So, and then there's a little bit uh, mix of some snow up here. And I mean, you'll notice I'm trying to work relatively quickly because the, the paper will dry on its own if I don't uh, if I don't paint on it. It's not the end of the world if I don't get it all done before it's dry, but ideally we'll have this whole layer finished um, before I've lost the water that's already on the page here. So this is just a, um, a painting that was taken from a reference that's a walking walking path in my neighborhood here. So we're in a valley and we're lucky that we've got, you know, we've got some natural areas to walk in. It's mainly ravines and sort of um, scrubby prairie. So not very many tall trees, but there are some trees here at the edge. And then you can see I'm just using the tip of my brush here to give that a sort of, just a sort of sketchy little feel. There's a hard edge here and I I don't dislike it. I'm gonna leave it um, with a little bit of definition. And there's one over here. That one was an accident because the snow wasn't quite wet. So that one I'm gonna paint out a little. And then there's like some fences. So that you can see a little bit the backs of houses over here in my photo, but that's not really what I'm interested in in the painting, so I quite like the little bit of ultramarine that's here, so I'm just going to go in and add a few darker areas. Uh, keeping in mind, again, this will dry lighter than it looks right now, so. It's so nice with um, painting, you know, and I, people often say to me like, oh, I can't, I wouldn't, couldn't do watercolor. It's, it's too unforgiving and it's, it's harsh. And I mean, there's an element of truth to that. I guess you don't have the same control always that you do in other mediums. Um, so you do have to sort of be willing to let things happen. And I know that can be hard for people depending on your personality, you know, if you're a little bit of someone who likes to have complete creative control, um, that might not be an ideal medium for you. But I found that, you know, if you're willing, if you're willing to let things do their own thing a little bit, um, it can be kind of exciting, you know, like what's happening over here. And I, I like that. I think that's coming out well. I'm leaving this whole area. Actually, you know what? Yes, I am going to leave that because it, I don't want it to bleed into the other area. This part is a uh, pavement here, so that's going to be quite a bit darker once I paint it, but I don't want the edges of the pavement to bleed onto where I have an area that's snow, and that's what I'm focused on right now. So, um, so that's all the snow that's been painted, and I'm going to gonna blow dry this and get started on the next layer. All right, we are back and we're going to be working on another layer here. Um, maybe I'll just set this here so you can see while I add some more colors to my palette. So we want to have some browns. Oh, that's flaking everywhere. Okay. Well, that's burnt umber. I'm gonna put that there. And then I'm gonna just brush that off my painting before it gets brown everywhere and makes a big mess which is too late because it's already on my hands. I don't know about where you are, but here we're at a pretty high altitude. So what I find is when I get tubes of paint shipped to me and I, you might notice I'm mostly painting with uh, Daniel Smith paint here. It's all packaged at sea level. 
So the difference in pressure means that when I open a tube, excuse me, I'm just gonna brush that off. Um, the paint usually comes globbing out everywhere. It's uh, quite an adventure. That's why I always have to be ready for that to happen. Um, then I'm gonna get some yellow iron oxide here for that sort of goldish brown that you often see in prairie grass and things like that. Now I wanted to have a darker blue because I'm going to be doing unstuck. That's where I keep my little doodad for. Let me show you. Here, this thing's the greatest. It is just a tube opener. And you put it around the tube and it helps you open tubes. You can also use, you know, pliers, but that tends to strip the, damages the cap. Okay, so here's Indian Throne Blue. That's quite a dark blue. And I ran out of little palette holes. That's why I'm putting it on the edge there. That one got some stuff there too. Okay, then I am going to use Carbazole Violet for a little touch of purple. And I'm kind of a sucker for this one, especially with the winter scenes, but it's um, Daniel Smith Primatech paint that is amethyst genuine. So there's actually ground up amethyst in here and it makes it sparkly. Hang on, that one was really stuck. Thank goodness for the tube opener. We're gonna put that one over here too. I don't know how much of it I'll use in this painting, but it doesn't hurt to have a little bit on the palette. It's still a fairly limited palette. Okay, I have to clean off my painting again, excuse me. Okay, so as you can see from the last time, everything is dry now and we've got our snow with some of the little divots on it. I may go back in and paint some harder edges, like some more clearly defined places there, but for now, that's not what we're going to be doing. The main thing that we're doing is I'm gonna start adding in some of the ground cover. So what I do is, and I haven't taken a video that shows my studio set up here, but I've got two containers of water, one that I keep quite clean and one that's dirtier. And that way if I need to get clean fresh water, I can usually do it. And so we're gonna start with a little bit of, I'm actually gonna take some of the Perinone orange that I used elsewhere in the painting here. Uh, I'll move this so that you can see what I'm doing as I'm talking about it. And then I'm gonna take a little bit of the burnt umber. I just want it to have that slightly warm undertone um, and a little bit of that guy. And then, you know what, let's just see how that looks on the painting. Now I'm painting um, quite dry. I'm not going to be pre-wetting, like you know you saw me do in uh, the previous sections, because these are hard edges uh, created by the snow in my reference photo. Here there is some just divots where you can see the ground through the snow. So it's a little bit of dead grass, um, you know. I'm just gonna paint those in there like that. This is when the painting starts to get exciting. You know, I was thinking before, the painting sometimes doesn't look like very much uh, in that middle kind of zone where we've, uh, you're, you're laying the groundwork basically. So you've started out, now as I'm, sorry, I'm, interrupting myself because I want to tell you about what I'm doing here. This area is where in my painting um, we're gonna have the highest degree of contrast here. So there's some trees and things and that's why I got um, also the purple that I mentioned, the carbazole violet, that's carbazole violet there. And so what I'll do is I'll paint an area with my brown and then you can drop in another pigment and let it just spread and add a little bit of definition there. So that's, there's a little a happy little tree. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I couldn't resist. Um, 
So you still got that sort of prevailing. I don't want it to be all dark, but I definitely want it to have that aspect. And then actually I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'll paint some of the thicker branches of this tree that's here, but then I'm going to need to grab, I don't even know if my rigger is gonna be thin enough, honestly. So I'll grab one of my teeny tiny, teeny tiny little, that's um, zero, zero, zero brush here. I need a bit more water than that. And then as long as it's still connecting to everything else that's being painted here, all these tiny little branches, tiny little branches will become part of the tree. And you try to paint, when you're painting a tree, you wanna paint from the main branch outward so that the thinner, thinnest part of your branch will be the narrowest part of your brush stroke, if that makes sense. So um, this tree actually has quite a lot of branches and I'm probably being a little too precious about it because I can just, and I'm gonna dip back into my carbazole violet. So it's not, not all one color, um, just like this. And that's gonna go over top of there and create a little bit of that contrast, the little definition of what's happening here. And if it reconnects with the main branch and the color spreads a little bit, that's totally fine. That's actually, it's nice. We, we like that. So there's no problem with that. And let's see what we got going on here. I wonder if I should try that rigor brush. Maybe I will. What's the harm? Oh, you know, there, I schooled myself. This brush is actually uh, gonna do a better job. So don't listen to everything. Don't listen to everything I tell you. Yeah, so anyway, you can see here, let's get some of that purple to make that trunk. See here how we're starting to create. And I mean, in my picture, this was, I don't know, it's just sort of a mass of, mass of random behind the house stuff. Cause this is, this is a back alley that runs behind some houses. So, you know, I, it's not the focus of the painting. I don't actually care what people's fences look like and things like that. So it's okay to just take and create sort of a block of color here that we want to read as one thing, even though it's not one thing, but when the eye is looking at it, you know, it just sort of blends together all in one. So I'm just gonna paint this whole area. And what it is is there's a little hill where the snow goes. And then you see that it can, it's starting to sort of give the impression that, okay, there's, there's something here. We've got some foliage. There's some bushes at the bottom that I'm gonna paint, but I'm mainly interested in these trees here right now. Well, let's take a little bit of that. Um, we get Indian Throne Blue. Oh yeah, I like that color. That's great. I like the way that those are. I like that those are coming out. Something that you want to think about as you're painting is um, in areas of high contrast, especially, but anywhere where an edge is meeting another edge. Are you creating something interesting? You know, like the eye is going to be drawn to those areas of hard contrast when someone's looking at your painting afterwards. So these shapes here, um, if we can keep, you can see I'm doing uh, sort of little brush strokes and I'm gonna use some of this amethyst because I like it. Um, little brush strokes, maybe a little more fiddly, but kind of um, almost like you're drawing with the brush uh, is what I like to do. And just gives it, just gives it a little bit of visual interest. And then you see I took and dropped some Carbazole Violet in there to keep it quite dark. 
or darker. Remembering, of course, is gonna be drying lighter than it actually is, so where I think that it's dark enough, it may not even be. So that's a busy little area there, but that's okay because what I want is ultimately the focal point in this painting is here where the horizon meets the pathway. So we're keeping that interesting. And then there are actually some darker trees that go over here, but I'm not gonna paint them right away because mainly because I don't feel like it, but also because there's another um, another tree in here, I think. Yeah, oops. So I messed it up a little bit here. I failed to notice that actually my stand of trees is coming from here. And again, that's fine because I noticed and this paint is still a little bit wet and activated. So it's very easy for me to just go from there I'm going to take a little bit of my burnt umber and then what we'll do is this again we've got you want to create a feeling of a little sort of shrubbery here a shrubbery um, and fill that in the funny thing about this amethyst color you can't really see it very well on the in the video probably but you know it does have that little bit of sparkle and it it's quite nice I like it I don't tend to go for a lot of sort of gimmicky I guess colors but um, that one I am a bit of a sucker for and then there's another tree here that's a, a conifer I have no idea like a pine tree or something that was back here so we'll just add that in there and then you can see how the work that we did painting the background with the clouds and everything is really starting to pay off for us because it's showing in this area of contrast. And probably what I'll do is um, I may well go back in here and add some darker darks. Like the, that's not bad, see, I'm just doing it as I talk about it here because it is a sunrise and it would look weird if there wasn't enough contrast between these things the way that there actually is. Just like that. Um, I may also take a little touch of purple and put it in here just to make it look a bit more natural. Like, you know, almost nothing in nature is completely flat. So in these areas of exposed grass, you've got variations of color and gives it a little bit of texture. And you don't have to get too precious about it. You know, you just drop those in. We're not, um, like I said, we're not doing photorealism. And maybe there's even maybe a section that's not brown underneath, but just a little bit of the brownie purple that I've got there. And that's, you can already start to see a little bit more the definition of that hill. You know, you might have been wondering, what is she doing when I was just doing yellow and blue on here? It looked a bit funny, but um, there's a method. I have a reason, usually, what I'm doing. Um, okay. I'm just trying to decide if we should do... Yeah, you know what, I think I'm going to do that. I'd like to lay down... Um, Maybe we'll use Indian Throne Blue a little um, on the asphalt there. This asphalt ends up looking quite dark. And we, I mean, we want that because it's going to provide some definition to this. Rigger brush is not going to be big enough for me. So I'm switching to my trusty round brush. So we can get this done faster. I don't think that tape lifted a bit. Oh well, it's not the end of the world. And you know, there's a few areas on here that as as I'm painting, you can see um, 
hard edges and like maybe paint didn't 100% go there and I'm actually okay with that. I'm going to leave that the way that it is. Um, because again, even the asphalt's not completely flat. There might be little bits of snow stuck on it. So I think that just makes it look a bit more natural. Uh, you can do things like masking fluid if you want to keep an area completely clear of anything else. And it's nice, but I'm usually a little too lazy for it. Um, I don't like the dry time of the, and also the, they tend to smell really badly. And I need a smaller brush as I get into the horizon there. The masking fluids have some really offensive odors and I tend to be pretty sensitive to that kind of thing. So um, what I, one of the things I like about watercolor is it's not an extremely toxic medium. I mean, you don't want to eat it or drink it, but it's not airborne because you're not, um, unless you're spraying it somehow, but uh, so you're not going to breathe it in. And as long as you're careful about eating and drinking near it, it's, uh, it's pretty good that way. So I like that aspect of it. And I tend to try to minimize my chemical exposure where possible. So I use masking fluid if I have to, but in general, I'm not, if I can find a way to do the painting without having to use it, then I prefer that. So, you can see here our even thrown blue, and actually I think I had it mixed with a touch of brown, so I'm going to just take a little bit of brown and add that in there. And that's the nice thing about painting with watercolor is, you know, if you're you're painting an area and it's still wet, which you can tell by it's um it's called the bead. You'll be able to see kind of the leading edge of where the water is. So if you still have your bead there, there is no reason you can't drop in another color if you want to, and it will just spread. So like we did with the trees, um, and that's what gives some of those beautiful variations. You don't have control over exactly where it's going to go, but if you know your material and you generally know the colors you're working with, you can um, have an educated guess about how things are going to look. So, and then there's just a little section of exposed asphalt there that I'm going to I'm going to go in and paint as soon as I'm done this big section here. See, yeah, it's starting to look like a, a scene instead of just random, random colors. I may have, end up having to just fast forward through all of this and take the sound out or something. I don't know if anyone's going to want to watch for an hour. Unless it's a Bob Ross sort of thing. You know, you just want to chill out, watch me do a painting. That's fine. I'm using Indian Throne Blue here again with a little mix of adding some burnt umber to it. And actually, there are, if I just glance at my reference images, there's a little bit more of this than I drew in the initial drawing. So I might just put a few. I don't exactly know what made it melt in, it, in the way that it did. Just from people walking. I know when, when you go out and walk nowadays, um, when you see someone coming, you have to move to the side. So it's almost like there's two pathways in one here. I'm really happy with um, how what we did with the yellow and the blue has worked out. Uh, I did something similar in another winter painting that I did last year, early this year. I, I don't know anymore. Um, and I was quite happy with the result there. Maybe a touch of that amethyst here. Yeah, okay. 
Now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so having painted that pathway, and I try to work left to right. Um, the main reason for that being, you may have noticed, I have a tendency to put my hand in the paint. So um, I, I put my hand down like this. And so if I don't work left to right, well, disaster happens sometimes. Um, so let's paint. Well, the next thing we're going to paint is this area up here. And not the entire thing, but just, just the area closest to in there. And there's a lot of trees. But there's also the sun is really shining through that area. So what I'm going to do for that one, I'm just going to find the right brush for it. And I will switch brushes partway through anyway. Get it nice and clean. Hopefully, not like I did before. Um, I'll start with it and then I'll probably use my rigger brush to just draw the um, draw the edges in there. See my whole this well is dirty. It's very important to keep a paper towel or tissues close by you're painting with watercolor. Um, you can avert a lot of disasters in progress if you have something to soak up excess water or paint both on your palette and in your painting. Um, so let's take a little bit of this, what did I say, yellow iron oxide, a little yellow iron oxide, because I want it to be not as dark as the area next to it. So I'm taking yellow iron oxide, I'm trying to show you my palette here. It's okay if a little stuff mixes in, because that's, that's part of what we're doing. And then maybe a touch of this Paranone orange that we used before. Okay, and I'm pretty happy with that as a, a base layer. And then, so what it is, is there's an area here alongside the pathway that is like this. I may drop some other darker colors in there after too, but, um, and so we're just gonna kind of make a block of color, a block of color like that, and then I want the color of it to sort of change as it goes. So then I'm going to add a bit more of the this brown that I was using. Oops, I got a little dot there. And we're keeping it wet because we, we want to keep using it after. And that's going to come up here. And then there's a piece of snow. So we're sort of, we're just going to go with that. And so that's our, that's our area that we're working with right now. And then I'll take and add a little bit of the darker browns because it is darker behind, but um, I still want it to have uh, this orangey aspect from the glow of the sun. So I'm just painting in a little bit of suggestion of trees here. Because that's what's there. And then what I'll do is I'll darken them along the horizon after. Okay, I'm gonna take my rigger brush and I'm gonna add some Carbazole Violet. It's a little too dry. You don't wanna have too much water um, at this stage of the game because you can end up giving yourself a nasty surprise when you add it to stuff. Yeah, that's exactly the way I wanted this to be. And then again, you know, I'm just adding in a few. These trees are further away, so you can't see, you can't see them quite as well, but, but you see how this area is wet and I'm just using it to make the edge of what is going to become the tree line. And the colors from that will just sort of merge. Like, you know, a little bit of purple will come down and maybe a little bit of orange will go up. And both of those things are just fine because that's part of what we were doing. I hope that any of this is helpful or, I don't know, if you're not a watercolor painter, you don't care about being a watercolor painter, you just wanna watch someone paint, well, then I suppose it's performing its function. Does that tree look weird? Sort of like a spooky Halloween tree. That's not the vibe I'm going for. I think it's this thick branch that's throwing things. Oh, there we go. 
I'll make it as if it was a uh, pine tree in there instead. Okay, and then keep adding a little bit here to our horizon. That's nice though. I'm uh, I'm happy. I'm happy with how this is going. And I mean, like you always have a creative interpretation available to you. Like you'll notice these are all trees um, and maybe in the photo they look sort of black, but I haven't used any green whatsoever, you know, and that's fine. I mean, you're still going to read them as trees when you see them. I think in earlier when I would have tried to do this painting, I might have made them black because in my mind I would have thought well it's you know they look black and that's the way it is but they aren't really and um, there's a lot more visual interest if you do not make things always black although black can have its place uh, watercolors don't often use it I just spotted a spot here that I missed with my Indian throne blue so I'm just gonna cheat that in there Okay, so what do we have next? Got our sort of orangey glow area of trees and then all in here it's, there's a lot more trees up along the edge. I'm not gonna do them right away. What I'm gonna do is take, um, I think this brush, yep. That's my size six round sable brush and I'm gonna do Similarly to what I did on the other side, I think I had a mix of these colors, um, which was, sorry, burnt umber, a little bit of iron oxide yellow, a touch of Perinone orange, and I'm going to just start painting in, I'd like it to be a bit darker than that, a little more concentrated. Okay, I'm gonna paint in this area of and again, what I'm doing is the same thing as I did with the edge. I'm doing sort of blocks of color. So here's going to be an area of the camera in a little bit in front of my reference. <laughs> i got to shift around here. So I'm going to paint right up to the edge of this hill. And then I will add the other trees that are up there. I'll add that after because you don't want to bite off more than you can chew in one section if possible. Like when, when you're doing a watercolor painting, you have to think about, okay, how much time do I have to complete this section before my paint begins to dry? So you see, I'm just uh, dropping a little bit more pigment in there. Um, and you know, I might even like, yeah, like even just a touch of, just a touch of alizarin crimson. Um, it's not really in, it's not in my reference, but it felt good to me at the time. Uh, so anyway, yeah, so you, you try to plan out a section. So for me, I know there's a mix of snow and uh, grasses here. And what I'm going to do is I will come back in with the rigor brush. And then the grass just sort of goes all the way along the edge of my pathway. Well, that's where people walk there. They let their dogs pee by the side of the path, you know. It's not the main pathway, but it's part of the walking path. Um, let's get a bit more of that orange. And then, you know, and it's just the suggestion of those things. Like, you're not painting every blade of grass here. That would be boring for you. And honestly, uh, I think boring for the person looking at your painting too, because that's not what you want to see when you're looking at it. Like, oh, well, that's magnificent grass. I mean, you just want, okay, is there another chunk there? And there's almost a sort of, it's kind of cool. Let's get a bit more of that red there because I like that section. Almost sort of a sweeping, like it makes a pattern like this, the way the grass is growing and the way the wind has blown it. So I'll just paint that there and that's already starting to dry. So. I definitely want to get in there quickly with my my rigor brush and start to add just some suggestion of the direction of growth here. So we've got all of these grasses and things and 
they're probably more scrubby than I've drawn them, so then you just want to add in a little bit like that. You know, and then when you're looking at it, let's get some of that um, amethyst. And again, there are darker sections over here too, so we'll mix those in. And when you're looking at it, you know, it's, it's starting to look, I think, let's get a little purple. I went in pretty dark there, but that's okay. It's, um, that's what it looks like. Uh-oh, that part was, whatever, it'll be fine. Um, and then just like that. So this part was still wet, so what you're seeing here is it, I drew the grass up and it's not sort of bleeding in, which is okay. Um, what I wanted was a mix of, and I can go over this too. I mean, you know, nothing is, it's not like acrylic. You can't get a fresh start, but you can definitely, you can definitely add on top of things within reason. If you have a really dark color and you, you went in very dark in an area, then that might be it for you. You might not be able to cover that, but. Yeah, so that's, I do like what went on there. Okay, so we're gonna let that dry and have a sip of water. And then while that's drying, we are going to go ahead and add, we're gonna go ahead and add our, uh, our trees that are at the top there with some of the darks. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing here. Some of the darks that we have. And it's not quite, it's not going to be exactly the same as what's next to it because that's not the area where the sun is. Um, and there's a lot of these kind of maybe tree section here. A lot of these bare deciduous trees. They're probably, most of the trees in this area are, we have a lot of aspens. A lot of people plant a particular kind of, because trees on the prairies have to be able to withstand a lot of wind. And especially in the Calgary area here, we get what's called uh, Chinooks throughout the winter. So a Chinook is a coastal wind from British Columbia that comes and it blows over the mountains and it comes to Calgary and it gets very warm in a short amount of time. So we have these extremes in temperature where you'll have freezing temperatures, you know, um, I'm not good at Fahrenheit, so it, let's say 10, 15, minus 10, minus 15 Celsius, uh, and you'll just have to look it up, sorry, but it's cold, you know, it, it's freezing, and then we'll get a Chinook, and suddenly the temperature will go up above freezing to maybe 10 degrees Celsius, uh, which is not, you know, the warmest, but in the middle of winter it sure feels like it. But anyway, that's hard on trees, um, apparently. That's not the best thing for them. So they have to be a specific kind of tree to be able to do well here. Deal with the wind and the cold and not being sufficiently covered with snow all winter because it melts. Yeah, see, I like that. I get caught up in areas like this where I just, you know, you can tell that I'm having a good time and I don't, I don't want to overwork them either, but Sometimes the temptation is there. <laughs> the funny thing is on this pathway, I think that side path that I'm painting, you know, and it looks really nice, like, oh, where's this side path going? It heads up the hill and there's a 7-Eleven there. So I just ruined the mystique. This is the pathway to the 7-Eleven. Okay, and then what I'm gonna do is this like sort of side to side one stroke for the main tree and then a little side to side see and there you have a pine tree which is I actually grew up in um, 
so about eight hours drive north of here in Fort McMurray, Alberta. And in high school, once the French teacher, whose name was Mr. Jeté, he wasn't from Fort McMurray, which I mean, most people are not from Fort McMurray because it's a bit of a boom town. So probably different for this generation. But at that time, most people had moved there from somewhere else. And he was talking one day and he said, you know, the first time I drove away from Fort McMurray to go down to Edmonton, like it was, it's the most boring drive that I could possibly imagine. He said, you know, you're driving along pine tree, pine tree, burnt pine tree, pine tree, because there've been different fires over the years, you know, so there are huge sections that are just burnt and then they're regrowing and then there's sections that haven't burnt. And I mean, he wasn't wrong. It's not a thrilling drive. Um, Although it is a beautiful place uh, that gets a bad rap. I mean, growing up there was good for me. Okay, we're starting to get, this is going places, I think. We need a sort of darker section under there. I'm getting paranoid that my phone was gonna run out of battery while I'm recording this. So I'm going to have to check it maybe after I'm done this section. And that's still a little damp, so I want to add, I think here is fine. Uh, yeah, that's a little trick for you, I suppose. Um, if you ever want to know if your paper is dry, well, first of all, don't stick your hands in the paint when it's obviously wet. Like if it has a sheen, you'll know that's not dry. But if you've left your paper for a little bit and you've come back and you're not quite sure, if you feel it with a clean hand, it should feel warm to the touch. If it's dry, it'll be warm to the touch. If it is still a bit wet, it'll be a little cold. So you can either help it along with a blow dryer, like I mentioned before, or just wait longer if that's what you prefer, depending on your time constraints. So then I'm just adding in some of these almost dry brush uh, grass areas here because I want those to stay quite sharp. I almost did, you know, I told you I'm always putting my hand in the paint. I almost did it there. <laughs> Don't do what I do. Okay, let me check, make sure that's still recording. Okay. It is running low on battery, so I'm going to stop here, and I might add a little bit more later. Oh, you couldn't even see me. Hang on. That's the entirety of the painting. Apparently I was working on parts you couldn't even see. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm back again working on this painting that you have joined me for most of here. Um, I noticed partway through the other one, sorry about that, this is the first time that I'm doing this, the camera was set up in a weird way that did not allow you to actually see what I was doing. So I'm sorry, there are sections where I'm talking and it's effectively useless because you can't even really see what's going on. Uh, so I have hopefully alleviated that. I've got this funny little tripod thing attached to my lamp now. so. I'm hoping that's a better view for you. Um, you might even be able to see my palette while I'm painting, hopefully, because uh, that would be useful. Um, but even if you can't, at least you can see what I'm painting. And um, we're kind of in the home stretch with this painting here. So we have painted already the sky, which was the first part that we did. And then I came back and worked on the snow that leads to the pathway. Now I'm just adding in some little bits here that I didn't paint initially. It's sort of more detail stuff uh, with the snow, the mix of snow and grass up on this hill. And uh, probably what I'll be doing is also going in and adding some darks here where the um, there's supposed to be more shadow. So like this grass here going to want a little more darks but I want that to be a little bit closer to me um, but yeah so you can see where the painting's going the other thing I'm thinking about doing and I mean this this is 
literally just the process of how I do a painting, whether I'm talking about it with you or not, is, you know, um, I stepped away for a little bit and gave it some time and space and sort of came back and looked at, okay, how do, how do I like how it's going? And I, th I think it's going well. Um, what does it need? I think it needs a little bit more contrast here. And I think it may benefit from some more definition in the snow that's to the side of the pathway. So I'll be doing a little bit of that, excuse me, um, as we're going on. But you know, other than that, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, pretty happy with how it's going. If you have watched this far, I have to thank you because I know this is going to end up being a long video. I think what I've added together so far is already an hour long, so sort of a slow process of doing this. I wonder if people will want to do it, like paint along with me or, you know, I don't really know. There was a little bit, a few people requested that I do some videos and talk a little bit about painting watercolor. If there seemed to be more of an audience or interest in it, it might be something I would do more, but you know, it does add extra steps um, to my painting process when normally I'm just sort of doing my own thing and I'm not explaining it to anyone, but, um, but it's been fun you know, I've enjoyed it. So if you have constructive criticism, please feel free to tweet at me or leave a comment. I think I'm going to post this on YouTube. So if you're watching this, it's probably on YouTube. So you can leave a YouTube comment or just talk to me on Twitter. If you probably know me from there, because no one's going to know me from YouTube since I don't even have an account there yet, but I will. Um, you know, and when I'm doing sections like this or just parts of a painting, sometimes it helps. I, I didn't do a value study. Sometimes you can do a value study. Like I know some painters always do a value study and that can be very useful. And what that is, maybe I'll address that in another video if people want, but you just do a little sketch and isolate the areas of say the three values, like the lightest values, the medium values, and the darkest values that are going to be in your painting. And it can just help you to make sure that you've got the kind of contrast that you want. Um, because, you know, if you're using mainly mid-tones, then it can just look sort of blah, or, you know, the painting could be too dark if you went too dark everywhere. And, you know, you could have a painting that's far too light if you don't make sure that you have a good variation of lights and darks. So doing a value study ahead of time can just sort of help you identify where you want things to be in terms of the overall range uh, in your painting. Um, but I didn't do that for this as it's fairly contrasty anyway. Just the parts back here are really dark and the path is pretty dark. Although you can see since I was painting, it's dried considerably lighter. I just press this tape down. You know, I was saying earlier that the paint, the paper won't buckle, but depending on how much water you put on it, um, anything will buckle still. So I just make sure that the tape is holding that down. So I like, I like how that's going. I'd like to add, and what I'm adding here is just mixes of some carbazole violet, some burnt umbers. I also noticed I was blocking a lot of what I was painting because of the way I hold my hand during the, earlier in the video. So I'm trying not to do that. And I put the camera above instead of kind of behind and then flipping it. So here's hoping that works. Um, pretty new at this. If I was doing it more often, I might get a more permanent setup. I think it might be shaking slightly too. So I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, so I've been been avoiding dodging my husband and uh, preschooler all day to get this done. <laughs> my husband said, all right, well, because ha we have a list of stuff we want to get done this week uh, before he starts back at work on Monday and, you know, it's the end of vacation. And um, he's on my list is that I wanted to paint because I really haven't been able to, my studio was a huge mess. I had to clean it up earlier in the week. So I'm really reaping the benefit of that now because I have this nice clean space to work in and so I had it on my list that I wanted to paint. Um, I'm just adding some more darks in this area here kind of going over top of 
a little bit going over top of. It's okay to deviate from them a bit though. There could be different, there's quite a few tiny little branches in these trees. So, um, yeah, so anyway, I have it on my list that I wanted to paint because I only get to paint when I have childcare. I can't imagine trying to do this with a, a preschooler underfoot. Um, so my parents watch our son uh, some of the time and then otherwise it's just if my husband's home and he's not working. But so he's got a big list of house stuff he wants to do and I have, you know, I, I want to do painting. So he says this morning, like, well, you painted, you know, so you can check that off your list. And I said, but I didn't finish the painting. So, you know, I'm, I'm not done yet. <laughs> he said, but I have so many things I want to do. So I helped him do some of the other chores that we had to do. And then my son kind of dragged him outside and I just sort of looked around and went, okay, they're outside, they're gone. I'm going back to my studio. I'm going to paint some more. So, you know, not a bad way. Ah, I put my hand in that paint. Not a bad way, that's what I was saying. That's why I don't usually work right to left, but sometimes I get excited about an area and I work on it and I forget. I forget that I shouldn't do that. Let's put a little more purple over here now. Make it again darker. Just a touch, just a little bit of some texture in these areas, you know. Yeah, so anyway, I, I escaped to do this because I'm sort of getting, I'm excited. I'd, I'd like to put the whole thing together and maybe post it. Um, I want some darker things back here, but I really don't want to know. You know what? They should start just about this. Might be more visible, but I really don't want to impinge on what we did there with the sort of glowing that area but this is more contrasted there so uh, another good tip uh, when you're working on any art really and um, we used to really emphasize this when I was in art college is take a break from it you know give it a little space but also take a step back you know so you can approximate that like what I was saying you might squint at your painting um, and what that does is just sort of helps sort of helps you identify the the sections and the values a little more easily than if you get caught up in the details but um, also you know stepping back and having a look uh, sometimes I'll prop a painting up um, so that it's upright instead of laying on my desk I'll prop it up and look at it from a distance or I'll walk away, I'll come back and look at it. And oftentimes when you come at something with fresh eyes, you know, you will see something that you didn't see before. And maybe you'll know what's the next thing you have to work on in that painting. And also sometimes you need to know when to stop because there's a tendency, I know um, I do it, and I'm sure we've all done it, where you, you just, you wanna keep on working on it or you think it's not finished so you keep going and maybe you end up with a painting that's a little overworked and you didn't have to do that and it doesn't look as good not as fresh or clean or interesting as it would have if you had just taken a step back and left it alone you know and it's um i'd say that's an acquired skill it's hard to know that off the bat like you're not going to always know you're not going to always know when's the right time to stop and sometimes you'll make the wrong call um, you know, another, another tip is whatever you're working on, it can be interesting if you have an area that has more detail, you're going to naturally draw the viewer's eye to that specific, I'm just getting some French ultramarine here, I don't know if you can see, uh, because I want, I didn't use any cobalt in this painting, I often do, what I'd like to do is I'm going to add um, so we have the sort of shadows in the snow, which end up looking blue because of the reflection from the sky. But I want them a slightly, a little more definition along the side here. It's very, very busy in my reference photo, so I don't quite want that much. But I'd like the suggestion, I'd like the suggestion that people have been here. You know, that's sort of part of 
um, what I'm thinking about with this. And another, this is like the opposite thing with the clouds. So make sure that you're making them smaller as they recede into the distance and then they won't be very defined at all at some point here. I'm just gonna get those really small and then they'll just, I'll let them become a solid block of color which we had painted before. Um, but yeah, I, I want it to be clear. This is a pathway people have walked on. Um, if it is a metaphor for the year 2020, um, we've all been walking difficult, some difficult paths this year. Um, but, you know, I don't know about you, but when I've been out on my walks and walking has been one of the things I've gained, I guess, from this whole pandemic is getting out into my neighborhood again and doing more walks. Um, it's comforting to know that there are other people, you know, I think back to maybe March and April and I'd go on these walks with just tears streaming down my face, you know, and, and anything could set me off. Like, that sounds really dramatic, but it, it was just a really emotional time for everyone. I mean, it was, it was frightening. The world was so weird. And as soon as, like, I'd, I'd hold it together and hold it together and then I would go out um, by myself without my toddler around um, and without my husband and just sort of, I, f I felt like I couldn't really stop my, I'd just start to cry. And I remember thinking like, is this what it's gonna be like every time I go for a walk? <laughs> but you, I wasn't even embarrassed because you just sort of, whatever, if anyone sees you crying, I mean, do you need to explain? Like, I, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. We all probably have reasons that we could be crying. Um, so that's how the walks started with the the pandemic sob fest walking. Um, but then, you know, I was on a much more even keel later in the year and I found I could go for walks and just start to appreciate, appreciate what was around me. And where I was going with this was I also appreciated being able to see that other people had also come there. Or, you know, I think we were all just sort of hungry for any kind of connection with people um, early on in this pandemic. So when I would see other people out walking, everyone was very friendly and, and waving, you know, like we're all in this together. Um, I don't know if that feeling has sort of changed throughout the course of it. What changed for me is I started doing, instead of um, just walking around, I, I'll phone friends and we'll, we'll talk on the phone. I have um, earbuds that have a microphone. So we catch up and we talk and exchange news such as it is um, while I'm walking. So I don't exchange, we don't talk as much to people we walk by, but I think people are still pretty friendly. You know, we're all just trying to get by uh, however we can. So I like this pathway as a painting to finish um, 2020, which I know a lot of people are eager to put behind us. The thing is, I mean, you have to, we're still in this, you know, it's it's not gonna magically go away just because the year is changing, but it is a bit symbolic and it can feel nice to get a kind of fresh start. At least there's hope on the horizon. We have the vaccine now and um, people here, frontline workers here are starting to get it. Uh, I know they have it in other places too. So I have hope that um, things will be better going into this year. So, so yeah, so here's my little hopeful painting. And I think we're getting close to being finished with it. I think, I don't wanna go too far with these um, footprints and shadows. I would like to, no, actually, no, that's pretty good. I was going to say, I, I was going to darken the trees at the horizon there, but I think that they're good. I think they may be good the way they are. Probably the pathway could benefit from another, uh, another pass here. I hear that uh, my husband and my son Patrick are back inside now 
because I hear someone yell, no, don't do that, stop it. <laughs> That's the sound of a toddler in the house. He's not really a toddler, I mean, I don't know. He's three and a half, so he does a lot of touching things he's not supposed to. Oh, I like that. I like the way that went there. I don't know if that's true for other types of painting, but I feel like a lot of watercolor is going, you know, ooh, like that. that's a nice shape or that's a nice brush form that happened. And then you just hope that the entirety of it makes a coherent whole. Yeah, that's starting to give the feeling that I want. Mm, I think I need, there's a shadow of something here. I kind of, I did a little, I took a little creative license. There's a few like, it's not a signpost, but I don't know, like a, a metal post to the side of the the pathway and I thought it looked ugly so I, I didn't include that because it's my painting and I can make it look like what I want it to. A few just sort of little dry brushing feeling there because it's in shadow on this side of the hill. I'm gonna have to wrap this up soon and go help make supper though. Oh, I thought that he was yelling no at Patrick. Well, he was, but I think I think they might be singing now. I'm not sure what song. Um, Patrick has very fine musical taste. His <laughs> current favorite song is Who Let the Dogs Out? So if you're the same age as I am, you remember that classic. <laughs> Um, so he likes to run around singing that. And also, I like to move it, move it. Um, and this is my fault because I'll play, uh, like, 90s dance mixes for him because he, he likes to dance. And he gets into that. But it sounds like the music is pretty loud upstairs. Okay, so I like... I'm, what I'm going to do is just roll my chair back and stand up and take a look. Look at it. Yeah, I think the main thing is that pathway wants to be a little bit darker than it is. So what I'll do is, and this is the brush, I, one of the brushes I was talking about earlier, the uh, Escoda Versatile, I think. It, see, I got a little mixed up because some of my, uh, some of my video was lost. I thought I was recording and I wasn't. Um, so I'm just taking Carbazole Violet and I'm going to just go over top of this pathway in a sort of sideways motion and that's on purpose because I don't want, I'm not going to fill everything that's here and I also want it to look like it's getting lighter towards the horizon so I don't want to go all the way up with that and then what I'll do is maybe just add a little bit of that's mainly Indian Throne Blue that made this before. So I'm just going to... It's still wet, isn't it? Uh, okay. Just gonna have that like that. And then just kind of naturally taper off there. Oh, that's one thing. Um, somebody, uh, my friend Raids, was telling me that if you post videos on YouTube, they can get weird sometimes about copyrighted music. And I hadn't thought about adding music, but um, if you would like there to be background music um, instead of just silence when I'm not talking, um, let me know if this is something that you enjoyed watching, but if you would enjoy it better with some sort of, I don't know, classical music. That, like background painting for watercolor. Probably not dance music. No, no, I like to move it, move it. I don't think that's our, um, no problem with it. It just doesn't fit the theme. And then 
gets a little darker towards the edges here, so I'm just going to And I'm going to see if I can figure out how to edit this to make it just a fast version too with, with, you won't hear me talking, but just to watch the painting happen maybe because probably more people have an interest in watching two minutes of painting than they have watching two hours of painting. I don't think it's going to be two hours, but still pretty long. Um, sometimes if I was feeling a little saucy, I might flick some color over here to make some splatters, but I, I don't want to today for that. But um, I may add, sorry, you thought you were finished with me here. I may add just a little, a few darker spots. I think that's the only, the only place in which this painting wants a little bit more. You have the ability to add on and change it a bit up until a point. Like you could even tape it back down after you've removed the tape and once it's dried. But like I said, I don't usually not usually do that. What I want is some shapes. I'm making really good use of this rigor brush here today. snowy area. Maybe a few a little dark up in there. Just add some variation. You know what? I think that's lovely. I'm really happy with um, I'm happy with this. Feels hopeful to me. That's what I wanted. You know, the sun is rising. Sun is rising and you can find beauty even in the pathway that leads up to the 7-Eleven. <laughs> you just have to work with what you've got, right? I can't wait to get out to the mountains um, when this is all calmed down and get some reference photos so I can do some more painting of different subjects. But you know what? For now, this is what this year looked like and has its own beauty. Could go get a big gulp after if that's what you're into. I don't actually usually go to the 7 Eleven very much, but. Alright. So, um, I think we're gonna call that done. I think that's finished. I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, if you watched this far, thank you for painting along with me and. Please leave a comment or tell me if you enjoy this, you want to see more paintings like this or anything else that's on your mind. And otherwise, have a happy new year. Stay safe. <laughs>